Hello and welcome to the Ben Like Bamboo Resilience Show. To Ben Like Bamboo is to master change with flexibility. And on the show, I get to interview and learn from very special guests talking about how to master resilience in our minds and in our bodies and in our lives. And today I get to interview the beautiful Deborah Lee Finesse. Hi, Deborah. Hi, Amanda. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It's my absolute pleasure, as you know. Thank you so much. And so um, I want to introduce you properly. Please allow me to, um, not that you really need a proper introduction, but let me just introduce you properly. Remind me of who I am. (laughs) I will remind you. So Deborah Lee Finesse is an internationally acclaimed actress as well as a passionate supporter of children and defender of their human rights across the globe. Deborah Lee's humanitarian work for children is a driving force in her life. It is her passion that children all over the world be given every chance to live a fulfilled life and achieve their full potential. As founder of National Adoption Awareness Month and Adopt Change in Australia, Deborah Lee has been a driving force for improving adoption programs, procedures, legislation and raising awareness and understanding of the issues of vulnerable children. Deborah Lee has been honoured extensively both in Australia and internationally for her work. Clearly you're very inspiring, you've achieved so much Deborah and um, you know what I love about you is um, despite all of that you're just so humble and um, I remember we met about six years ago and I just felt an instant connection with you. Thanks Amanda, I will talk about inspiring, excuse me, you are completely (laughs) inspiring and when I heard your story I was completely blown away because I am the eternal optimist and I always think, no, 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 there is a way out of this or we can do this. So I'm big with resilience and you did it. You Thank did you. it. You came from being paralyzed and in a wheelchair to this beautiful, vibrant young woman. Thank so you. Thank I'm you. inspired by you. Oh, thank you so much. And it's so easy to forget because we adapt. So we adapt to change, yeah. but we adapt to becoming well. And, you know, I have to sometimes, and thank you for saying that, that it does remind me of, oh, yeah, I did that. <laughs> it's a big deal. It's yeah. A, it is a big deal. It absolutely We do adapt. Like I just had a pain in my uh, IT band and I'm like, oh, it's killing me and da, da, da. And then, you know, I've been doing these exercises and then it got better and I completely forgot. And I was like the other day, I said, oh, my God, it's gone. Like I just took it for granted immediately that it was healed absolutely it's It's only you know that we 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 should have gratitude for that like wow yeah I think you know it's it's when when we go through suffering and adversity and pain um it it really allows us to it's the polarity of life isn't it because then when it goes you're like oh I forgot how normal just feeling well how amazing that is and I guess that is the gift of adversity isn't it yeah no I think yeah and you talk about resilience like I I read something the other day and it's so true. Uh, They say children who have have suffered great adversity in their childhoods, like, you know, kids in the Holocaust or war or poverty, um, they've had to learn from a very young age. And these people, as they get older, have greater resilience because they started at such a young age. Like, and I'm often amazed, like I've read these books about, you know, survivors of the Holocaust. They live to such an old age. And yeah. you would think with all that trauma and all that suffering yeah. and what they had to live through yeah. that they they would, you know, it, it would end up creating disease or something. But because of their resilience, it actually made them stronger. And I see them living to these ripe old ages, like in the 90s and hundreds, some of them. That's so interesting. I absolutely agree. You would assume that because of everything they've gone through and the burnout in the mind and body and cells, Mm. that yeah exactly that they would perhaps you know be more unwell but yeah there's we're still learning the duality with some of us we get stronger with some of us get we get weaker it's just the duality we don't know how we are and I always put it down I'm fascinated with epigenetics yeah and what we inherit from our mothers grandmothers grandfathers I think we come in with the DNA program of um, emotional inheritance which which you know we carry a lot of the times it it doesn't actually belong to us but we carry it on through our genes it's so funny you say that i'm reading a book at the moment called it didn't start with you and excuse me i'm working with mark wellin who wrote the book oh my god i'm loving it it's it's a great book isn't it exactly well that's i want to i i want to write a screenplay 
And I, and I, I was always told, don't write a screenplay about something you know, write about something you want to learn about. And yes. this to me is fascinating. I've heard that book and I've always believed this. So I'm using him as my research partner to write a screenplay about epigenetics, which I want to make right. a black copy. Yeah, I think because I look for novels out there or yeah. fiction about this subject. Yeah. And I think it's kind of a new, some people still think it's a bit woo-woo, but yeah. it's actually science. And there's no novels out there because I was looking to sort of adapt something. And I thought, okay, well, we'll just write one. Well, to give people an insight, so this guy, he has he has migraine, had migraines and um, and he was suffering and he wanted to get more answers as to what that would be about. And when he, it didn't start with you. Um, they've, they've done studies on... Um, mice, I believe, where they've proven that um, it stops. Um, so my mother and my grandmother, so three generations, is what comes through to us of their stress. So if, whether I was in my mother's belly and she was stressed and that comes through to my how my genes operate, how my receptors and cells behave. Um, so sometimes people have unexplainable anxiety or panic attacks and they're like, this doesn't feel like it's mine and it can be passed down from our mother and um, grandmother and our grandfathers as well, so both sides. But apparently it only goes through, uh, there's lots of different research, but this guy's research is it stops at three generations, but you can break the chains. I'm not up to that bit of the book yet, but I swear, Deborah, I was I was reading the book and there, were, there have been moments where, you know, you tab books. I took it to a whole new level. I, let, I remember standing up, you know, when you have a moment in a book where you read something and you have this massive breakthrough and you have to stare into space for a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but that's it just resonates we, we know our truth yeah. we know our truth so when you hear truth yeah. you go yeah yeah that, that's it that's why when I was this book I went I 100% get this this yeah. makes sense to me it makes sense to me that we yes. inherit our nervous systems our, yes. our stuff and I've and I continue to see generations of people my mother did this like the stupidest thing like my grandmother did mayonnaise on eggs or something I mean it's the stupidest stuff can come through yeah and we and we we play it out i had another woman she said my mother got screwed in business my grandmother got screwed in business and she got screwed in business i mean that's such a random thing yeah but there's something in that in what they're playing out that keeps regenerating I and, think that's and when it's trauma you have to learn how do you stop that how do you break that when it's a negative Exactly. And resilience is all about how you can rise above and see your situation from that higher perspective. So we can, so you can have conversations with yourself about exactly what we're talking about now, rather than being in the drama where we're merely reactive. When we take that higher point of view, we can have a higher understanding and connect the dots and go, oh, maybe there's a, a, a bigger reason why this is happening and helps you to overcome what you're going through on a whole different level, doesn't it? But it's very hard. It's very hard for a lot of people to be able to get that bird's eye view and have that clarity that you can actually work it out. It's it's like being a detective. See, I like that. Yeah. I like being a detective and joining the dots. Like this screenplay I'm running at the moment about three generations. Cool. Um, and I'm connecting the dots and like, okay, what quality is going through here? What quality? And I'm sort of connecting the dots and it's so much fun to play. Wow. Yeah. That is the, co- the I, um, that is the coolest idea for a script I've ever heard. Thank you. No, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not being serious. That is amazing. That's actually quite tricky and crafty. That's going to oh, be. Oh, yeah. Ooh. I've got a whole diagram. We're like running lines. It looks like an astrological chart. This one goes through <laughs> here with this son. This is the daughter. And I, I'm trying, I mean, it's a comedy as well. So I've literally covered every demographic, every demographic, <laughs> every child and person has an issue. And they're really interesting issues. I love it. So, so you know, wait for the film. I'll let you know when it comes out. Oh, I, will be, I will be there. I will be there. I'll be the first person there. No, I, honestly, that's really cool, De- uh, Deborah Lee. I think that's wonderful that you're you, – that's what I love about you. Everything you do is filled with meaning and purpose. See, I always have to have an objective. Like, with an idea why – like, even when I speak to you, I go, well, what is my – we said this before we started. Yes. Everything I do, I, I have to have reason, like, what I want to do. And I'm – like, I did a podcast, I said, and someone said – oh, I really got that part and it really changed my day. So yeah. if I change one person's day in the way they think about their life, I'm thrilled. Absolutely. Well, absolutely. Well, let's um, start with a juicy question of what, what does resilience mean to you? What do you think resilience is all about? I think I have a lot of resilience. Someone once said to me, Deborah, your mojo is, like everyone has a mojo, she says it is to overcome. And I had never looked oh. at it like that. 
Cool. And so I think that I probably throw down more challenges than I need to in my path yeah. because I must get something out of overcoming. Is it the victory run? I don't know. But I love to overcome. And I think resilience, when you talk about resilience, to me, that everyone has resilience. We have to. Because yeah. what's the alternative? What's the alternative? Inertia. Yes. It, it, it's uncomfortable. It's nowheresville. It's inertia. So resilience is like breathing. We innately as human beings want no stress, no anxiety, and we want to be happy. We do. If we could sell happiness, it'd be the, you know, Amazon would be out of business. It'd be the biggest thing in, you know, the world. Happiness is what we all want. So resilience is, is we're, we're always, every day, you have to have resilience. I mean, getting out of bed, we're always fighting something. You get out of bed, what are you going to fight? First thing, gravity. You know, there's always a pushback. There's always something that's going to be in your day. And there's always going to be challenges. There's always going to be something that's going to undo you during the day. And I think more so now during this time of COVID, we have yeah. those challenges are multiplied. We've well, got social media, we've got the pandemic, we've got, yeah. you know, financial worries, we've got, you know, political worries. There's, there's so much out there that causes us so much stress. So we have to be really creative how we see things and how we deal with things. Oh, you raise a good point there. We have to be creative to be able to rise above and see and remember, because I think that, you know, big adversity that like when I was paralyzed or what we're all going through right now with the pandemic, um, it reminds us how resilient we are because I think we forget. I think we forget. And it is all about giving the mind and body the best environment to be creative and innovative. So how, how do you do that? I do it through creativity. Yep. To me, um, to me, being creative gives me my joy. Being yep. creative, being creative keeps me in the moment. I paint, I design, I write, I have, I, I, I cook. So yep. whenever I'm engaged in a creative process, it brings me totally into the moment. And so, then that's the secret is being as present in the moment. Because, you know, Bruce Lipton's work, he's all about, work. you know, Bruce Lipton, the biology okay. of belief. Yeah. yeah. And so he talks about how, you know, we're often so stuck in the past or the future. Um, which That's we're, anxiety. We're, the yeah. future is anxiety and the yeah. past is regret. Exactly. So Happiness how do, is being in this moment. Exactly. So maybe when you're cooking and you're being creative and you're writing and you're designing, what you're actually doing is you're bringing yourself back into the moment, which Bruce Lipton defines as our most creative state. Oh, and it's our most happiest state. I tried to do it. Hugh and I used to say at the philosophy school, and they always sort of said, bring your mind to the working surface. And, yeah. I, you know, doing the dishes, it's not exactly thrilling. It's a boring moment. And then I started to use that philosophy when I was doing the dishes. And in the end, I was having the best time doing the dishes because I was really looking at that piece of spinach left on that plate. I was really rubbing that spinach and I got the end result. It was beautiful. It was shiny. It was clean. And I passed it on. I wasn't somewhere else. I was with the spinach on the plate and it brought me great joy. Now, I use that. It sounds ridiculous. It's not. It's but perfect. It's just like you, you change something. You change something. It was you made it beautiful. You, you, and you just because you were present, you saw it. You fixed it. You did I think something. You, I think you change your energy and your frequency when you just do one thing. How many times do we sit there watching TV and scrolling on the phone, doing two things at the same time because we're just, we don't want to be in our bodies or we're very stressed about something. So we're distracting ourselves. So I love oh, that. I can't sit still. I can't just watch TV. I, I'm always, I'm missing or <laughs> doing something, but I'm a little ADD. It wasn't available when I was young, that diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd say that, but we're the most creative types and, it just means my mind works so fast. Yeah, yeah. But I can't just do one thing. I'm a big multitasker. Yeah. And I have to have a purpose, as you say. Everything yeah. I do has to have a purpose. Because that grounds, grounds you probably. Purpose. Yeah, yeah. I love that. So I think that's really juicy golden nugget that you've just dropped where really um, so many people will relate to, to being in exactly the same way. But it, over the course of the day, whether it's doing the dishes, waiting at a, at a, at a bus stop or a tr train stop or any moment where you would usually, because you're just stopping for a moment where you might distract yourself with scrolling on your phone, just stop and be very present in the moment doing one thing. And if you do that multiple times during the day, you are bringing yourself into your most creative and adaptable state. 
and it grounds you. I'm reading a book at the moment. By, I'm reading a book by Zadie Smith. Yep. And um, she's a great writer. People should check her out. But she's yep. just written a short little book about the pandemic. Yeah. And, you know, she's a writer. And she and people say to her, why do you write? And she just, look, she just goes, it's something to do. <laughs> and I loved, I loved her simplicity. Mm. We have so many hours in the day. And she was just, especially during the pandemic, we, we, yeah. especially, I'm in New York. These are eight type personalities. They're like, diversion, diversion. It's a city and da, da, da. And we're all having to just go, I'm just writing. I'm just sitting in the park. I'm just doing this and that's got to be enough. Absolutely. And I love that. It sort of turns me on in this weird way. Have you found that hard to do in um, this year and what we've all been through with the pandemic of having to slow down? Oh, my gosh. I am uh, completely, I'm a like yeah. doaholic. I'm always moving. I'm always doing something. I've always got to be like, I'm a, I suppose I'm achievement orientated. Like it's got to be productive. I've got to be going somewhere. I've got to be going somewhere. So, yes. yeah, it's really hard for me just to, to sit see. and be and for that to be enough. What are you doing when you are at your, in your most present state other than what you've already said, obviously, painting, designing, writing? What's, what's the one thing, your go-to ritual perhaps that really grounds you? My creativity. When, yeah. I'm, when I'm designing or painting, like I've just been downstairs this afternoon and I was getting ready to, to do my paint and I'm just there ruling and doing the thing and I'm completely blissed out I love that so if, if we if the goal is to give our minds and bodies the best environment to be more flexible and adaptable and creative um, what are the pillars of health that you stand by for you that help you to be at your best and more, most resilient okay I'm like you and I'm very mind body soul they're yeah. all connected it's all you know one affects the other yeah. Um, and our emotional state is so important. Yeah. People don't realize that every little charge, every little moment that happens in the day has an impact on your body. Yeah. It has a physical impact on your body. Yeah. And that is the mind making a judgment or having a perspective that you've attached to it that gives you the emotion like, oh my gosh, I, I, I need to do better at my math class because I'm a loser if I'm not good at math. And therefore, I'm terrible. Yeah. So that's just a judgment. It, it's not that important. But we place these things on ourselves. So the mind needs to be healthy. Our emotions need to be in check. Yeah. Our body, how can you be at, uh, out in the world without a body that's working for you? You have to put good shit in it. I mean, yeah. you know, you're putting genetically modified food in there or crappy sugar. Sugar is not good for us, let's face it, my love sweets more than anything but it's just not good for us yeah. um we have to be so mindful and where the food comes from from the farm it's everything's got an energy so yeah. i'm really conscious now and i find that when i go to the supermarket here i look at it and it looks it's in a pack and it's covered in plastic and it looks boring whereas i go to the farmer's market yeah and there's a life to it there's a feeling and that gets ingested and i know this sounds like woo woo but i think how the food comes to us how the gardener who planted those seeds his energy goes into that mm. i truly believe it goes as far back as that absolutely and that comes into us so mm. what we put into our body gives us well-being and the, yeah, we the have intention. to ex yeah mm. and we have to exercise we have to use this body if you like anything if you don't use it, it just it just rusts or breaks down and mind body soul soul is our our, our true authentic selves and i think we get away yeah. from our authentic selves because we're out there in the world presenting, you know, Deborah Lee, the actress, Deborah Lee, the mom, Deborah yeah. Lee, the, 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 and we get away from our, our truth, which hurts us when we're not authentic and being who we are, it hurts us. I it agree. Takes us away. It takes us away from our truth and what we're, what our purpose is, what we're here to do. It do takes think- away, it takes away our strength. Do you think who you surround yourself with is really important to help you to remain, yeah, authentic? Good company is the ultimate. Yeah. And 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 absolutely, if you surround yourself with, say, whingers or this or that, it's going to drag you down. It's going to make you down. And I think we innately are gra- we gravitate to people that feed us, that make yeah. us see ourselves the way we want to be seen. 
yeah. but how um, uh, you have the same values. It's all about values. We, we gravitate to people who have the same values as us in life. Yeah, I agree with that. Everything's really a mirror image of um, the mindset we're in. So we'll attract people that are where we're at. So I yeah. think, you know, often when I'm, if I, if there is something going on in my environment or in interpersonal relationships, I've learned to look at myself and go, well, how am I healing that within me at the moment? Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to do that. Oh, totally. And it's hard when you have friends who, you know, and they ask you to do things that it's not your values or something. My greatest thing recently said, what said to me was, no is a complete sentence. I think we hurt <laughs> ourselves. I think we hurt ourselves when we were people pleasers. Well, I am. And so we want to help people. We want to do it. But when we do it and it's not right, yeah, it okay. hurts us. It does. So you've got to cut to the chase and go, you know what? That's not good for me. I will resent you because you're making me do something that's not enabling me. I absolutely and you know so what? I, I, I and I love that no is a complete sentence. I mean I I do sugarcoat it, but I've really tried to be strong when I do say no. I call that the inner conflict because you know we have ideas and that's you know on the top of the iceberg, and then what we believe is what matters. And you want your goals to align with what you're believing about yourself and what can be possible. And when um you say yes to something you don't want to do, you, you, you you're creating an inner conflict, and you feel that like exactly as you said, you you know and when it you're comes not out as resentment. And yeah. what does resentment feel like? It's awful. It's I hate resenting someone. It doesn't feel good. It makes me feel not kindly towards someone and I, that makes me sad I don't like it no but the way to release that I think is to first look within ourselves of why we let that happen why we said yes because we've been trained to be polite to people please well yeah. you know as little kids we we people please because we get our needs met yeah. if I smile they give me a, a candy you know we, yeah. we learn from a young age I think to make people happy because that makes us likable it makes us get what we want we we're, we're little girls well i shouldn't just say little girls but yeah. you know little kids are the best negotiators they learn very young what they have to do to get what they want yeah i absolutely agree hey well, how old were you when you moved to new york when you know you first started acting 20 20 That's i crazy. came here as a young girl and i felt like christopher columbus I rang home and I was like, oh, you guys, you guys, this is amazing. <laughs> I, found it, I found it exhilarating. And I have to say, I'll share a little something. Yeah. You know, like growing up in Australia when I was young, there was still that leftover, that macho sort of male, misogynistic, madman-esque quality in Australia. Yeah. And, but I grew up with a single mum who was very powerful and she was a businesswoman. So I never got to do the girly thing like, I just always thought chicks were in charge. So, but, so it was always hard for me in Australia. I couldn't do that submissive thing. And when I came to New York, I wasn't looked at as an object. It was like, Deborah Lee, what have you got to say? I was just, I wasn't, a, uh, I was a woman, but it was like, it was an equality of like, what do you got? And I didn't feel that in Australia back then. Right. It was always a bit of a, and I saw it with my mom, you know, like she was a big businesswoman, but she was still having to fight the guys. I mean, I think we've come a long way and it's so much better now. And we realize how powerful women are, but yeah, it's not that long ago that they weren't, they didn't have the power. Because the reason I asked you that question is I was going to ask you, so where does your courage come from? Obviously it's from your mom. Yeah, totally. And courage. Yeah. I always, I, people have also asked me, what's your best quality? And I always say courage because I think, I think I have had a lot of fear in my life, Yeah. but my resilience makes me fight. Like if I'm scared, I was, scared. I think I became an actress because it scared the shit out of me. It scared the shit out of me having to get up there and perform. Yes. And I, I think that that, I hated that feeling of fear. So my courage my courage was no, I'm going to conquer this. Yeah, and I and I still battle that. I still battle that, but think, it's it's something I I have to do. It's something I, I, I think it's really inspiring. You know, not everybody's like that, and I relate to you. I, if I something scares me, I just throw myself out there, and I'm like, well, now I have to do it. <laughs> and yeah. 
lucky that I'm, you're lucky. We're lucky that we're like that because not everybody is. But the trouble is, um, yeah, we, we find it hard to know when to pull back and when to slow down. And But to be honest, I wouldn't change that about you. You have to look after ourselves. Yeah. Well, I wouldn't change that about us because when you have the courage to put yourself out there, you make things happen for yourself in more ways. It feels like magic sometimes. Do you feel that way? Yeah. I mean, the opportunities that have presented themselves when I've yeah. really stepped out of my safety zone. Yeah. I've gone, wow. Talk about that because that's juicy. Like this is what people, for the listeners out there that aren't, doesn't, don't have that natural courage. Yeah. What? what happens when you actually put yourself out there out of your comfort zone? What's the magic that happens for you? Well, you overcome. That's my thing. I think my life, you know, people have different things that they do in this life. Mine is to overcome. And I think that when I do something that has scared me and I kick a goal, it is exhilarating. It's like, it's thrilling. So, and I, I get to give myself a goal start. Yeah. I get to give myself a goal to try that, you know what, Deb? And, you know, certain things other people might do just easily, but I know it costs me more. So that means I've had to use my courage. And yes. people are unaware. People are unaware yeah. um, of what it costs you. We all have that. Yeah. We all have our individual thing of we're unaware. That's why I'm always so conscious when I meet someone yeah. not to make a judgment, not to make a judgment because you have no idea. My favourite thing is be kind to the person standing in front of you in front of you you have no idea of the mountains they traverse or that they have to climb and you know i i think courage is when we do take on those those hurdles and we jump over them and it feels exhilarating and it's because you've proven to yourself what you're made of and if that feels really you know what that is that's the alignment from the inner conflict and then you overcome you change your mind about what can be possible for you and then that changes what you're thinking and believing I mean Dr Libby Weaver that's how we met she introduced me to you six years ago and Did Dr Libby Weaver and oh, she, I, I, she's a rock star yeah, yeah I yeah. worship that woman she's amazing She's yeah. so inspiring and, you know, her work is all about what you think, feel and believe. That's right. She introduced me to me when my mom was really sick. Yeah. And I love what you do and I've always believed in kinesiology because it's like the body doesn't lie. Yes, thank you. And I more agree. so the mainstream medicine. I, I got really stuck with mainstream medicine. They were not giving me the answers that I needed because I knew it was deeper. Yeah, and I yeah. think kinesiology goes deeper. It does. It, I think taking a balanced approach is really sensible because there's great things that the Western model offers that the Eastern yeah. does not. It's, it's, it's everything, but it's unity. Yeah. It's like anything, but bring it all in together. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And it was, yeah, it was a pleasure to meet you all back then. And, um, you know, it was it was a wonderful time. And uh, I know that was a really hard time for you. I required the resilience needed for me after when my mother was sick Yeah. and traversing her illness for almost four years was, was I think the greatest uh, uh, trauma in my life like seeing my mother it's like almost like I was like saying to God how could you do this I know that's the way the world works that we pass on after a certain time yeah but I, I could not there's a still part Pollyanna in me and I was like I can't believe this it took so it took me years to really process her passing What's the biggest thing you learned? That I can survive, that yeah. I, I, I survived it. And, I, and that I can still now feel her presence with me. Do you? I, I, it's like interesting. It's like it's an, I just feel she's in another realm. It's beautiful. That gives me comfort. Absolutely. And I, I truly do believe it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, Let's, this is so this is so much fun talking to you by the way I love talking to you like we, I remember when we um, met all those years ago you know you were so lovely to me and you would sit down you would make me a cup of tea and I had a lot going on with nourish and you know all the different things I was doing and you were so kind to me and you were like okay Amanda you gave me all this advice and oh, it was just so kind of you and that's what I love about you you're so real and authentic you're like the girl next door but you obviously this but I love what you were doing. I believe in what you're doing and I want to encourage you. Thank you were like, to me, you were like, doesn't everyone else get it? <laughs> that, you, that you're doing what we're supposed to be doing. I saw in you 
what I believed. I, I, I just saw you knowing that it's, it's, you just, you knew what it was about. Thank you. And a lot of people don't realize the nuances and the subtlety of what disease is, what, what, um, what we need to do to progress. That's why my life's mission, and thank you for helping me with this today, is to spread that message that no matter what we are all going through, we can overcome it um, and, you know, and discover what we're made of. And when you can adapt and be more flexible and creative and in the moment, you're giving yourself the best chance to overcome anything. And, and like, you know, all the stuff that comes through from generations, there is of, there's a, a bigger reason why we go through what we go through. It's supposed to be the ups and the downs and, and who we become, going through all the stuff is, is, is what leads us to be the next version of ourselves that um, really aligns us with who we're supposed to be next. And therefore all the things that you want in your life right now, you've got to become the new version of yourself to heal your body, to find love, to be successful. It's about going through all those things to get there. I think. Well, your pathology became your vocation. Yeah. Because of your journey, you saw how important it was. So it's almost like it's the same way with me, with um, having my my adopted children. Yes. I I was given that that as my life's, you know, that's how my children came to me. Different to coming from my groin. That's how they were given to me. Yeah. And therefore I it it became it ended up being my life's work. Not my life's work, but I ended up speaking out and advocating yeah. because I could see the issue the same way that you did. So yeah. through our experience, yeah. it fed us to bring purpose yeah. and to share with other people what the possibilities are and how you can traverse this stuff. So Absolutely. I agree. Uh, and that's a beautiful way of looking yeah, at it. Thank you for pointing that out. That's that's super cool. No, it and is. And it's like, and we share our experience, like you do. I do with adopt change. Like, guys, you can offer yeah. a child a beautiful family, and you get giving so much uh, hope to people who think they're hopeless. It's, it's not. really important. Hope is everything. It, totally. My organization in New York is called Hope Land. Again, yeah. addressing vulnerable children. Yeah. There's hope. You can do something. We're addressing poverty. That's the root cause of so many children being out of family care and so we address that so that these children don't have to be relinquished so they don't end up adopted they can stay with their their birth families who've gone to the other end to yeah. support that but when a child is abandoned then let's make adoption fabulous and make it work and you're making such a difference in the world and that is very nourishing and i think we can all do that for ourselves once we <laughs> it requires courage. It requires putting yourself out there, believing in yourself. And what I love about you, Deborah Lee, is that you know who you are and you know what you stand for. I think we all need to do at least that for ourselves. It's, it's trust, really. It really comes down to a trust issue, doesn't it? Correct. You have to trust that your gut and your intuition is right. And that's why so many people, people, yes. so many people doubt, oh, maybe oh, I shouldn't, I don't know. Yeah. Go for it. Go for it. Trust your gut. Trust your gut. Everyone's got something to give. Everyone's got something to say. Everyone can make a difference. And That's everyone what is I special. Like. People think, oh, I can't make it. Yes. Yes. No, and everyone. everyone. Authentic and special. You know, we've got this life embodiment and, you know, we, we're all individual and we're all bought here really. I think we all have a purpose. But maybe that's why we go through adversity and why we get slammed on the floor sometimes totally. to discover how yeah. capable we are. And when I walked again, that's what I felt. I was like, wow, I did that. And I needed to go through that experience. Not that I would wish that on anyone, but for me, I had to go for that experience for whatever reason. And this is the reason to show myself. Because you're using it now to inspire others. Come on. Yeah. yeah. I just had a friend who had a stroke. He's a young, fit surfing. Steve Lee, he's a, he's a, um, he was an Olympic champion. He's Australian. He, he's just had a stroke at 58, the gosh. fittest guy in the world. Oh and I, I've said to his family, please check out Amanda. Don't buy into that they're saying you're going to be stuck in a wheelchair for the rest of your life. No, have some faith, have some trust. Look into alternative way of thinking. I think the belief, that what you believe, 
if you believe it's going to be good, it's going to be good. If you believe it's going to be bad, it's going to be bad. Yep. Yep. So yep. you're right. You're right. However you think about it. What we believe is what matters and what we believe yep. is connected to our biochemistry and we're either firing growth and repair signals or survival and stress. So what we believe you've nailed it is what absolutely matters. And the body and the mind is connected in that way. I'm a big manifester. I totally believe in manifesting. I, I actually, part of my daily ritual is I write a, I write a daily design. Do you? And I, I recommend this to everyone. I write a daily design as if it's happened. I don't oh. say, oh, this is going to happen. I will like write a daily design. I'm thrilled my children are excelling at math. Yeah. Not their, not their speciality, but hey, I put it out there. Yeah. Um, but I will, I will, and so many times I have written a manifestation and then I see it realized. I, I've become a big manifester because I believe if you put it out there and you say, this is what I want, we have to own what we want. I think, and especially Australians, we're like, uh, we don't evolve. Yeah. Ask for what you want. Yeah. Keep it. We, we it. need to. No one else. to believe that you can do this. Yes. And, and it's our responsibility to do that for ourselves. It's not a dirty thing to do. It's, it's not selfish. Like we, we, if you can do that for yourself, you're going to be of better service to all the people around you. Um, yes. And it is all about trusting yourself, your gut, but learning how to trust yourself. Because so many of us, we don't trust that we're going to, we know better or that we can make the right move and decision. And the only way of doing that is anytime I've been thrown in the deep end, like when I, um, you know, had to, I was running a company and I was thrown into leading it and I hadn't done it at that level yet. And, and I learned so much, but it was only by um, being thrown in the deep end, did I really discover some skill sets that I had and you know, don't be scared. Like, I love your courage. That's what I love about you as well. And I embrace failure. I really do. Yeah. I think the greatest thing is, like I realized that recently, if I'm not willing to fail, I haven't got the freedom to fly. Yes. Like, unless I can go fully in and go, I believe this, and it could be so off the mark, but it might be brilliant, but I've got to be willing to fail. And you know what? Oh my That's God. just a moment in time. You blipped. You failed. Big deal. Moving on. It was an activity. You didn't hit it. Like that's when I make, when I write, I make big choices and it could be terrible, but I go bold first and then I pull back. But you've that. got to be willing to fail because what fail is going to teach you more than anything. And is it the worst thing in the world? And is it really it failing at all? Does it define who I am? <laughs> but if I you don't... don't Exactly. But why do, you, why do we have to hit it the first time? Are we really failing at all? Is that an illusion anyway? Yes, it is. It's an illusion. What is yeah. that? It's activity. We're here. We just do stuff. Something to do. Do you know how we many do. times I fell over when I was learning how to walk again? Like if I had stopped when I fell once, I wouldn't, you, you just fall. Did you do a blooper reel so we could? I really wish up. I did. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been it's good. good. It's like make fun of it. It's like, okay, look guys. That's really good we advice. Get so Don't take life too seriously. That's yeah, can we get so serious? Oh my God, I wrote a terrible script. Yeah. So it's okay. You're still who you are. You're still Amanda. I'm still double A. We're yeah. nice. We're like trying. Doing you our know, best. When I'm doing my journaling in the morning, so I do meditation and journaling in the morning. That's my thing. And walking and eating well, obviously. Me too. But- so I write, you know, my, my intention in the morning might be, I'm going to be playful today. And I throw that one in when I know I have been taking myself a little bit too seriously. And I've got so much work on my to-do list is way too big. And then I get up in the morning and I put the very bottom of my to-do list. I put that to the top. Then I do something that scares me. And then I'm, I'm reset. So what's your ritual? I want to hear your ritual. What's your daily ritual? So I wake up in the morning and, um, you know, I make sure I have plenty of hydration, um, I take my time in the morning. I've got my beautiful dog, my black pug, Henry, and then I'll have um, breakfast. Um, but before before I have breakfast, I, I've got my journal on my bedside table and I have morning questions that I answer. So what is my intention today? How am I feeling emotionally? How am I feeling physically? Like honest answers. And then three things I'm grateful for. So that helps me to fire um, growth and repair signals instead of survival and stress. Um, and then I, I, I get up in the morning and I, I go for a really long walk. Um, and every second day I'll do Pilates at, at the moment on Zoom with my beautiful Pilates instruct, instructor. And then I'll come back and I'll do a deep meditation for um, a good half an hour, just 
what we wash our bodies every day how do you wash your mind of yesterday's thoughts old redundant ideas and beliefs so I try and be as still and quiet and I empty my mind and I find this stillness within me that awakens my higher self guidance and I do I get downloads and I get guidance and it's my my inner voice but it's something else telling me no 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 go this way not that way yes yeah, say yes to this don't do that you gotta listen to that and, and that's what makes that. me trust. A lot, of people don't trust. A lot of people don't, they go, oh, I think that, but they don't trust it. But they can't hear themselves because it's so busy. Because it's so busy. Exactly. Yeah. I know my morning ritual is I wake up and straight away my husband makes me a cup of tea. Yeah. And we sit there and we read something. At the moment, we're reading Sadie Smith. Beautiful. Um, which is this book about time, the time in COVID and what goes on. So we read that, we discuss it, then we meditate. We meditate, then we take the dogs for a walk over in the park, whether it's freezing, whatever, and yeah. watch the New York lifestyle, all the people out there, all the different characters, which is great. Yeah. Um, and then we play backgammon. Bit of fun. I always look cool. forward to that. You and I are very competitive. So we play backgammon. And then I feed the dogs, and then we both do our workout, and then we attend to the daily emails and what we've got to do there. And then I step into my creativity. And then I start with my, what do I want to achieve today? What do I want to create today? What do I, you know, want to manifest? Mm. Manifest, yeah. Mm. I love and that. Then, and, the kid, and the kids in the, in the afternoon, I've got my children who then, you know, I want to hear how they're doing and, and they feed me. It's like, how are you doing? And, and the kids, we, we, you know, this is tough for them in COVID. I mean, I've got a 15-year-old. Yeah. And this is the time where they're, learning their social skills and all that and they're on a zoom they're online it's like yeah it's hard so i need to give her you know support and understanding and and get where she's at and fill her with joy in life that she's not getting which she would normally get in the interaction social interaction do you guys have an evening ritual as well do we what do you have an evening ritual as well yeah we <clears throat> always have dinner together yeah. My son's actually in the kitchen now creating. He's a very, he's an alchemist. <laughs> he makes everything else. Love it. I got my son cooking um, and we always come together at night and we talk about politics or yeah. what's going on in the world. My daughter's into social justice so we hear what she's got to say. And yeah, and we hear, we listen to them and mm. hear where they're at and what they need to express. I love that. I love that. And I think it's beautiful reconnecting with the family. And <clears throat> I, um, I make sure I, sometimes I meditate again and then I have an evening ritual of journaling where I'll say what great things happened today. Yeah, no, that's good. What the recap. Think, well, yeah, a recap what great things happened today because you forget and you're like, oh, yeah, this happened, this happened. Like tonight I'll be like, I spoke to Deborah Lee Finesse <laughs> on my show. That was a really cool thing that happened. And then um, I also write down what difficult things happened today. You know, get it out of your head, onto paper, close the tabs in the mind. It actually closes the loop. I read a really good book by um, David. Uh, it was called Getting Things Done. And um, it was about closing the loops in the mind. So I write down what great things happened today, what difficult things happened today, what did I learn today, and what is a step I'll make tomorrow is my evening. And do you follow through? Yeah. Like now that I do it religiously, yeah, and I feel like I'm doing the work and then that translates into my morning and how I'll, who I'll become and what I'm manifesting within myself. And it helps with, you know, when we're going through trauma or change or um, you know, something big in our lives because every day we're going through change all day, every second of the day we're going through change. But sometimes life brings the bigger change like divorce, pandemics, ending or the start of relationships or businesses, you know. Um, and, and if you're doing this kind of work, all these rituals we're talking about right now, it is so much easier to um, go through them so that you can be resilient and it's being resilient is not about avoiding and going around it go through it and then the people we become on the other end of that is what creates that elevation you know and i think we've got to have fun we always forget as grown-ups yeah i think as grown-ups we forget that fun is a part of the deal oh so many grown-ups get so bogged down by the seriousness of seriousness of life but fun it seems like it's frivolous no 
I think it's one of the most important qualities that we yeah. we need to do for ourselves. I love that. And it makes us so so giving to others when we're in our joy spot, joy. when we're at light. It makes us so it's so easy to be able to give to others and pass them that baton so that yeah. other people feel good. You know, there's magic that happens in joy. My toe moved for the first time in the moment well, um, shortly after a moment of joy that I experienced after going through such a difficult time in rehab, thinking and believing that I would never walk again, being told I probably wouldn't walk again. I can't um, imagine what that was like and that you thought that that is extraordinary. It was wow. rock bottom. It was black hole yeah. abyss stuff, I'm telling you. And I had no choice. Well, you don't. When you have no choice but to succeed, you know what you do? You just you lean into the dark abyss and you just jump because you just that's when you hit rock bottom. That's the gift of rock bottom. And then I I then had many weeks of just crying and going, okay, big black sunglasses. Okay, this is my life. I'm 29. I can't wash, walk, or feed myself. And then and then there was one beautiful evening. I have very supportive family and friends, and the girls came and put me in my wheelchair and they um, wheeled me across the road to a restaurant. We just had dinner. We just had dinner and we just relaxed. I forgot the 24 7 hell just for a few hours. And we laughed and laughed and, and just were in the moment with each other. And I felt this jolt in my brain. And I thought I was just feeling really happy, but something changed. And I came back to my room on my toe move for the first time. Did you know that? That was you the I came back to my room and my toe moved for the first time that night. And I believe it was from receiving joy because of the polarity of going through such a difficult time. Just being in the moment with my friends created such joy in my mind and in my body and, and maybe all of my cells that it um, shifted me from being in such a survival state totally. to growth and repair. <laughs> totally. Yeah. Did you ever look when you were going through, did you ever look, did, well, because you're a kinesiologist, you understand all this workings and machinations. Did you go deep and realise where the root cause oh, of yeah. disease? Well, I decided to um, study when I studied. And I don't want to put you on the spot, but I know no. you talk about that. No, and no, I love talking about this. It's like this is my life and my work. It's So I um, decided to study sports kinesiology because I found a course that was government funded, just so happened to be a mixture of sports science and kinesiology. And it was a couple of years of full on like Chinese medicine, new language and anatomy and physiology. And I definitely walked up to the reception and I tried to, I nearly quit twice, but thank God I didn't because it was the best thing that ever happened to me. It was really hard because my grandmother who was virtually like my second mum died during that time. It was very hard. It was very hard. But anyway, I studied. And yes, as I studied and we had to work on each other to learn the modality, I unpacked all my shit. I unpacked all of the dark shadows that I that was out of my awareness. So I thought I'm a quite an outgoing, confident person like you. So I think, yeah, I believe in myself. I'm good. But there was stuff there that was way in the inner conflict and that I had suppressed for a long time. That so you had, had inherited? That you had inherited? And that I absolutely had inherited. And I'm a twin as well. So my twin sister has Crohn's disease and she was diagnosed at 11. And and there was like, there's so, it was so much stuff to work through. Crohn's is a holding on, isn't it? Crohn's is a holding on to your shit and not letting go. And small intestine and blocking receiving and um yeah the stomach is very much about anxiety and over worry and ms is the, the brain and the control center all my stuff has been about believing that i am in control of my life and letting go of the idea that i'm out of control and yes when i was a child there were moments where i fully felt out of control and it put me in survival but then i had to learn how to control my emotions and my energy so that I could learn to trust myself that even when things threw me in my life, like my twin sister nearly dying or my parents separating and all the stuff that happened and changing schools too many times, stuff that just blew my circuits. I had to learn as an adult to really be my own anchor. That's what bending like bamboo is all about, knowing who you are and what you stand for and finding your own inner anchor. And you have to fully lose yourself and die almost. Um, to, and the way that you find yourself way find your way back is the rebirth and how you discover all that stuff so that's when my body started to heal and this is my 11th year of no new lesions and no disease progression I take a balanced approach I'm on medicine as well because I had a very serious attack that paralyzed me so my lesion here if it ever expands if it's too hot one day I, I lose feeling in, in the whole left hand side of my body but 
every other day, like maybe that happens once or twice a year, every other day, so 360 or three days a year, I don't have really any symptoms at all. Like I might get fatigued sometimes. Yeah, my bladder plays up sometimes, but really you wouldn't know. And I really believe it's because I cleaned up not just mental and emotional stuff. It was it was spiritual stuff and the stuff that came through from my mum and my grandmother, 100%, by the way. Yeah. Maybe this is what it is. It's so interesting. It didn't start with you. No, it didn't. Yeah, it's and that's so okay. fascinating. And just the awareness around that is liberating. Isn't it? It lets you let it go. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. all about believing you can change it. And that's what the flexibility of bending like bamboo is about. Believe in yourself. Believe that you can change what is possible for you in your mind, body, and life. And I've always, I've always thought people tell me no, and I'm like, nah, I'm not listening. I'm a born optimist. And I was like you. I went to ten schools in my life, so yeah. people don't realize if for a young kid, that's it's traumatic. a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, a lot. So I had to learn resilience. Was what I learned very young. I was in boarding school when I was five. So I yeah. learned very young because of life circumstance. Yeah. Um, I learned very young resilience. So I, that's a natural to me to know how to overcome. Well, I think that you are so amazing. I cannot even tell you the joy I have felt this hour that we've been speaking. Thank you Thanks, so much. Thanks, Amanda. And I love talking. You know I love talking to you because I love the way you think and I love what you're doing and I think it's cutting edge and people think of it as, you know, alternative to me. Mainstream medicine is alternative. This is truth to me. The way you view uh, our health and our and disease and the way we operate to me makes so much sense. So I'm thrilled to support you in getting your message out there because that's what I believe is true. Thank you. That means the world to me from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. And in the show notes, I'm going to have all the links guiding everybody back to you and how you support adoption, all the wonderful things that you do. Right. No, I love people to be aware. Thank you, Deborah Lee. Um, all right, everyone listening, no matter what you're going through, believe you can overcome it and discover what you're made of.